Thanks very much, everyone. Um, this is the final of the your lecture series that we will be doing with her, and we'll be restarting them again next March. So, particularly good of you all to come under the circumstances with current health issues, etc. This is an absolute honour and privilege to have these three here. <coughs> it's a really uh, unique combination I have beside me. Um, I'll mention Courtney and Rick, and then Anne Beagle Hall will briefly introduce Monica. Rick has been with us since about 2011. Uh, Rick's been one of the pillars of support of the Royal Horse Centre. He's just been weaving in and out, always doing practical things, always supporting us. Um, and it's just lovely having him here again in this capacity. Uh, he's one of the research assistants dealing, I think, with the Hebrew situation. So, Rick, many welcomes and thanks for all your work, Centre. On the far right is Courtney, the second research assistant. Courtney works with Monica and Giacomo Lipner. And Courtney is doing translation from German to English. So the three people together sort of weave in and out in the Mumford Winkler uh, multilingual um, poetry. Um, they're going to tell you about their current research project on it. So Monica has been with us for many years as well. That, which makes it particularly special. So I'll ask um, Anne Beagle how to introduce me. Shall I stand here? Yeah. But I have to take my mask off. Is that all right? Just... And it's um it's a real pleasure to have um, Monica back. I don't know, I can't, did you just mention that, Irene, that um, was it like a few years ago now you gave a talk about mm -hmm. Holocaust poetry, which was very moving. It was, um, it really brought tears to the eyes. So it's great to have you back for this talk. Mm -hmm. And just briefly, I know, because I know you've got to, a lot to say, at least all three of you, and I, um, I just um, tell everybody a bit about you. Oh, I meant also to say that Monica and I have met, have known each other for quite a while. We um, we both we were involved in a book about um, child survivors of the Holocaust, child victims of the Holocaust. And I, some of you may remember Simone Vigliotti, who was also at Victoria University. And Simone and Monica edited that book and wrote um, some articles in it. And I was one of the people involved. So that's that was quite a few years ago now. I should know how many years ago, but I don't. So just to um, more specifically about Monica's career, she's senior lecturer in German in the School of Languages and Culture, Culture at RIC. And she's taught German literature since 1996, first at Geneva, University of Geneva, and since 2006 at RIC, um, specializing in Holocaust literature, memory studies, diaspora, exile studies, and uh, well, these are all relevant topics to the, um, to the topic today, Manfred, Manfred Winkler's poetry, her current project, or one of her current projects. Um, she's received international awards and grants, has numerous publications, books, and articles. Um, her other books, apart from the one I mentioned about the child victims of the Holocaust, are on art in exile and German dream literature. So um, really welcome, lovely to have you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Irene and Anne, for the invitation and for the kind words of introduction. It's a great pleasure to reconnect with the audience of the Holocaust Center, with friends and family, with my students from Victoria University, and uh, as you mentioned, this is the last public talk in the Ledor Vador series, which has been running now for a couple of years, successfully run by Irene. And somehow it's very meaningful to me 
to have this talk now round up the series for this year with Rick and um, Courtney joining me in the true spirit of Ledor Bador from generation to generation. And uh, as Anne has mentioned, we are delighted to share some thoughts about Bukovina born, Jewish German writer Manfred Winkler, whose poetic and existential self discovery is probably best captured in his own words paradox and faith belong to the foundation of my poetry and my life. Light and darkness, day and night, time and eternity. They sound like chords and rhythms to me, these strangely image producing sounds of words. Sometimes they pull me down into the depths, yet with the help of my first, I fight my way up again, up even towards the sky, and fall just as often back down to the earth as our last resort, however we try to twist and turn it. The seeds for this talk were planted during a conversation with Rick about his engagement with the Holocaust Center as board member responsible for relationships and partnerships. Rick's reminiscing reminded me of similar conversations I have had with Manfred Winkler about his writing in German and in Hebrew and about his activity as director of the Herzl Archive in Jerusalem. My connection to Manfred Winkler dates back to 1999. That was the year when he was awarded the Pri Israeli Prime Minister's Prize for Literature. He was invited to give um, poetry recitals and talks in Europe, and I moderated his uh, poetry recitals in Switzerland. A long friendship ensued and at that time, and 15 years later, Shortly before his passing away, he asked me to look after his literary state. There are all these illustrious professors, he said, who write such intelligent things about my poetry, but I need someone who is both a poet and a scholar to look after my Meshugane works. I need you, and I don't envy you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so that is how I remember Manfred, warm, tender, wise, and humorous. So the first critical edition of Manfred Winkler's German poetry was published in 2017. Literary critics on national um, radio, German national radio, referring to it as one less blind spot in the German-Israeli dialogue. Here you can see the cover of the book, and if you are curious about it later on, it's uh, with us today. And our current work now on the centenary edition sought to document Winkler's bilingual authorship in German and in Hebrew, as well as his activity as a translator of literature from seven languages, builds on my previous experience with his German poetry. This edition is a contribution to the recently established scholarly field of German Hebrew studies, which seeks to promote an in-depth understanding of German Hebrew cultural dialogues. Naturally, the focus on the literary and cultural intersections of these two languages, German and Hebrew, raises challenging ethical and political questions. As my colleagues Amir Eshel and Naama Rokem note, in the wake of the Holocaust, German and Hebrew may intuitively seem to inhabit mutually repellent magnetic fields. The notion that the two could cohabit a cultural space, coexist in a single mind, 
or even speak simultaneously within one literary text may seem hard to fathom. At no point is this research meant to present the history of German Hebrew encounters, which as we know dates at least as far back as to Moses Mendelssohn's famous Torah translation in the late 18th century as a single continuous narrative. The radical break that occurred with the rise of Nazism and the Shoah casts a shadow on any talk about German Hebrew encounters. It is nevertheless hoped that a carefully nuanced approach in the field of German Hebrew studies can cast a light on the complex German Hebrew encounters that occurred mainly in the work of the very few German language authors who made fourth and fifth Aliyah to Israel and established themselves there as bilingual writers. With reference to the progressive ideal of German Jewish reciprocity centered on a political notion of civil equality on the ethical basis of universal human rights, research fellow Jan Kühne suggests that such encounters represent an attempt to revive, continue, or initiate a bilingual dialogue between German and Hebrew, which seeks to transcend the pervasiveness of monolingualism and national paradigms. Quite tellingly, Winkler himself, in his critical essay about poetry in Israel, emphasized as early as 1970, the universal transcultural aspiration of literature. Today's poetry in Israel, he wrote, is modern by nature, adapted to the times, but also deeply rooted in this soil. Old and new, tension and faith, desert and mountains interact. There is a lot of searching, experimenting. The latest experiments in world literature are being attempted by a whole series of talented poets. For quite a few poets, the relationship to their homeland is a twofold one. Somewhere there is another country of childhood or youth that cannot be forgotten. The imagery of the Hebrew language, its Eastern spirit has accepted the European Western with reservations and is perhaps therefore in contrast on a new path of linguistic and poetic self-expression in which universal elements meet, collide, and combine with folk and national idiosyncrasies. So in what follows, I will share some thoughts on Winkler's bilingualism in the broader context of early 20th century debates about the role of the Jew as a mediator in a foreign culture. First, I will provide a brief background with reference to Manfred Winkler's biography and important historical cultural moments of his life. Second, I will briefly sketch out a framework for viewing Winkler's poetic practice as a model of transcultural, dialogical literature. Third, we will present a selection of poems that can be regarded as a rare and highly original expression of poetic mediation. Courtney will then round up our presentation, sharing some thoughts from her own perspective as a translator of Manfred Winkler's poems into English. So coming to Manfred Winkler's biography. Here we have a map of the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire up till 1918. And you see up here, that is the Bukovina, the Eastern outpost 
of the Austro-Hungarian Empire with its capital city, Chernobyl. So Winkler was born, thank you. Winkler was born um, up in the north of the Bukovina in Putina into a secular middle-class Jewish family. During the Russian and subsequent Romanian and German persecution of the Jews in 1941-42, he was deported to forced labor camps in Transnistria. At that time, he was 19 years old. And after the war, he was again displaced and forcibly relocated to communist Romania, from where he made his way to Israel in 1959. He was 37 years old when he started learning Hebrew at Kibbutz Beit Alpha. So here is Manfred with his wife's family who took him in. Within a year, he won the annual poetry competition of the Israeli Ministry of Education and earned himself the reputation of a miracle child of the Hebrew language. He completed his Ulpan and studied Hebrew and Yiddish literature at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And in 1964, he was appointed director of the Herzl archive and editor of Herzl's complete works. For over 60 years, Winkler was active as a writer, as a literary critic, translator, and sculptor. He was also the central figure of the last literary salon of Yekes in Israel and their poetry circle, Luris, where he was known as one of the few who on his journey neither wanted to leave anything behind nor had refused the new and yet unknown. So here we see Manfred in his different roles surrounded by his friends in the Luris circle. And we also have some uh, examples of his works as a sculpture, um, his sketches, which adorned his living room. And you see in the middle there, a photo of Manfred and his wife, Herma in their late eighties in Suhadasa where they lived. Um, and again, one of his illustrated typescripts. By the time of his death in 2014, Winkler had produced eight volumes of German poetry, a further four volumes in Hebrew, and two anthologies in English translation, as well as many literary translations from German, Hebrew, Yiddish, Russian, Ukrainian, Romanian, English, and French. Winkler's unusual German Hebrew authorship and multilingual translated work is remarkable for its rarity and also for the cultural vision that underscores it. As a poet, he drew inspiration from contemporary events and his own life experience, as well as from many cultures and literary traditions. His poetry therefore reflects critical engagement with Jewish traditions of language and thought, offering poetic reflections on a Jewish experience after the Shoah, whilst also promoting a dialogically hybrid approach to the notions and representations of identity, language, and literature. Since he was schooled in the city of Chernovitz, also known as the Little Vienna of the East or Jerusalem on the River Prut, where he experienced eight different ethnic communities living together in more or less mutual acceptance of each other until the Second World War, we can safely say that he acquired the special competence that is attested to Chernovitz, defined in German as incongruence, compensations, competence. Don't you love <laughs> German language? Meaning the knowledge and skill 
to interact with diverse cultures and people and maintain at all times a certain equidistance. So here on this slide, we see a couple of snapshots of turn of the century Chernovitz with its Ringstrasse, a copy on miniature of the famous Viennese Ringstrasse, and down below the impressive building of the synagogue. And then we have a demographic map of uh, the Bukovina. As you see in yellow, we have uh, marked the ratio of the Jewish population in Chernovitz, which in 1930 was actually the majority of Chernovitz population, 26.8%, which led Emperor Franz Josef to call um, Chernovitz a successful Judenstadt, uh, Jew Jewish city, the city of Jews. Through his older brother Gerhard, who was active in Zionist and communist circles, Winkler familiarized himself with cultural Zionism and the ongoing debates about the role of the Jew as a mediator in a foreign culture. In the early 20th century, literary critic Julius Bob sparked these debates with his essay, The Participation of the Jews in Contemporary German Poetry in which he argued that the German Jews tended to become mediators rather than creators within a foreign culture. He was insinuating a connection between the mediating role traditionally played by Jews in the European economy and their contemporary position as literary agents, translators, and critics. By affirming the role of the Jew as mediator, and denying his role as creator, Bab sought to defend Jewish contributions to German culture and counter the aggressive folkish nationalism that was on the rise, especially the folkists' malicious claim that the Jews not only dominated German culture, but also threatened to contaminate it. So there was a certain apologetic ring to Bab's theory. On the other hand, he also sought to distinguish himself from the so-called cult of the Ostjuden, of other proponents of Jewish renewal who looked eastward, calling Eastern Europe the living center of Jewish culture, to which German Jews had to look and draw closer in order to reinvigorate their own creativity. And names like Fritz Mordecai Kaufmann, Jakob Wassermann, and Martin Buber are known to all of us. I don't know, should I ask a question right now? Because I'm burning. It's about Yiddish, you know? I mean, yes. Yeah. Are you coming to that? Uh, or what the role of Yiddish in all this? Yeah, you know, especially then Daniel Goldman, and they're not born creators, but just. Yes. We can let let's bring that up at the end of the talk. Okay, right, sorry. We, I'll I will okay. shout it and have it. <laughs> I keep wondering about it. Oh, am I? Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. So Julius Bab based his theory and argument on Hegel's conception of a universal high culture, to which nations and individuals in search of enlightenment are naturally drawn, by which none, but which nonetheless remain confined to the intellectual achievements of the West and the ideal of German Bildung. His attacks on the ghetto culture of Eastern European Jewry were not appreciated in the Chernovitz literary circles of the time. Aware of these debates from the time of his secondary education in Chernovitz and deeply impacted by them, Winkler crystallized his own position during his activity as director of the Herzl Archive in the late 1960s, 70s. Echoing Bob's view on the potency of cultural mediation, but purging it of its denial of creativity, he proposed an alternative understanding of culture as a pluralistic anthropological category and in line with the humanistic ideal of an all-encompassing culture available to all, irrespective of ethnic origin, 
and religious, ideological, or political affiliation. His artistic practice enacts these views, most poignantly captured in his motto for the critical essay about contemporary literature in Israel, have many, speak to many, in Eretz Israel and the world. Seen as such, Winkler's work offers a model of transnational, translational approach to literature, as recently described by cultural anthropologist Wolfgang Welsh in his theory of transculturality. Welsh defines transcultural literature by migrant and displaced authors as literature that expresses loss and alienation, as well as constant oscillation between two equally active cultures and the production of a novel complex reality. The result of such a creative exchange beyond any claim of cultural hegemony is a hybrid aesthetics and a dialogical literature that draws on a series of sophisticated literary devices to create permeation in content, style, form, and language. In Winkler's work, the most common Permeative literary devices are, firstly, suggestive metaphors that blend diverse landscapes, cultural spaces, and the realms of the past and the present. Secondly, multilingualism, manifested as integration of transliterated Hebrew in modern German or vice versa. That is to say, as a kind of literary code switching. Thirdly, a transcultural intertextuality by which European literary traditions and Hebrew classical first mix and merge. And finally, translation and self-translation, understood in the manner of a Viennese poet and critic Karl Kraus, predicated as transcultural and translingual bridging, or the consensus of two thoughts in a novel linguistic form. So we will now illustrate the notion of cultural mediation and cultural creation in what I have described as Winkler's transcultural literature. And this brings me to my first point, living between languages, between landscapes. For Manfred Winkler, the borderland between the German and the Jewish cultures that Franz Rosenzweig described as Zweistromland, the land of two rivers, a translation of the biblical name Nacharaim, was a metaphor that became reality. His linguistic and geographical commitments were complex and divided. I argue that his poetics represents an attempt to inhabit this Zweistromland, this borderland between the two languages and cultures, as an alternative cultural space in Hobi Baba's terms that would be the third space where the cutting edge of translation and negotiation occurs. In 1959, shortly after his arrival to Israel, Winkler stood on the edge of Maktesh Ramon, overlooking his favorite desert, the Negev, his senses overwhelmed. The following poem ensued. Wüsten Kaddish. Die Palmen, die Psalmen, man hält sich Hand an Hand. Das vom Meere west begrenzte Land dehnt sich wie ein Schwert von Nord nach Süd und spießt sich ins Rote, tief unter dem Toten Meer. Die Palmen, die Psalmen, wie von ungefähr steigt die Sonne auf, blüht und verblüht auf des Wassers blaugrauer Ebene. Die kupferbunte Welt der Felsenberge 
säumt alles von West bis Ost ein. Nur von Süd nach Nord steigt das breitflache, graugelbe Land bis zum Hermon empor, dann und wann von anderen Gebirgen beengt. Die Palmen, die Psalmen, wir liegen in den Schlafsäcken der Nacht, halten uns an den Händen, Schakale wachen am Rand. Und von den Wadis gemahnt der Ton eines stummen Schofas an die uralten Klänge. Schlafende Kamele steifen ihren Hals. Jitkadal, wenn Jitkadash, Schmei Rabba. Is it Kaddish? The palms, the psalms, one holds hand in hand. To the west, the sea bounds the land, stretches like a sword from north to south and pierces into the red deep under the dead sea. The palms, the psalms, as if by mirage, the sun rises high, bursting and dispersing on the waters, blue gray plain. The copper colored world of Mount Sinai edges everything from west to east. Only from south to north does the far reaching gray yellow land rise up to Hermon, impeded by other mountains now and then. The palms, the psalms, we lie in the sleeping bags of the night, holding each other's hand, jackals watching at the edge, and evoked by the wadi, the sound of a quiet shofar resounds those ancient melodies. Sleeping camels stiffen their necks. Yit karar, yit karash, shemei chaba. The first sentence of the Kaddish prayer, exalted and sanctified, be his great name. Winkler's encounter with the exotic scenery of the old new land, as he called Israel, in reference to Herzl's novel with the same title, inspired the expression of an intimate rhetorical connection to the land of Israel in poems such as this one. Deeply moved by the landscape and its sounds, the speaker immerses himself into a new cultural space whilst his words involuntarily glide into the Hebrew of Kaddish, Vadis, Shofa. His divine praise of the glory of nature, opening with a reference to Psalm 92.13, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon, culminates in the final line with a quote of the mourners Kaddish in Aramaic, Yitkadal by Yitkadash Shmei Rabba. With these words of praise, and prayer for peace <coughs> over the vast landscape of the desert. Winkler's modern German embraces biblical Hebrew. The spontaneous merging of languages in his poetry and the creation of a zwischen Sprache, an in-between language, is just one example of how he sought to weave together sound and meaning and mediate between languages and cultures. The spontaneous blending of landscape imagery and the creation of a zwischen Raum, an in-between space, is another example of how he sought to weave together sight and meaning and mediate between landscapes and cultures. The same relationship of passionate inwardness with the exotic scenery of Eretz Yisrael can be noted in the poem Wo der Tag die Nacht liebt. And this poem, I think actually for the sake of timekeeping from here on, will have for those who read German, the German on the PowerPoint slide, and Courtney will just read out for all of us the English translation. With the day loves the night. In the reflection, the poisonous oleander blooms. Brother Absalom sidesteps his own.
The broken stones blink at many graves. A herd of goats paves the way. A woman in black stands unswayed. It is the late afternoon hour through which one must go to the lion's gate, past the rock cut tomb. It is. The great unknown already slightly reddens the horizon. The windmill beckons its master to the west, as if humanity was still here. Oh, these experiences of an ancient and medieval occurrence, as if you were, as if I came from a Carpathian hollow, Carpathian bridge, chapel, shingle roofed. A sustained blow of the horn trembles there in serpentines. The air is like lead and wax, a sand ship sails over the hills and the desert winds. I'm already walking, but I don't know where to, perhaps just walking. It is no longer out of sight where the day loves the night. I think this poem illustrates superbly how realities overlap in time and space, and the difference between the Eastern European world of the past and Israel's world of the present is annulled when the author's imagination, his associative imagination, is triggered by a strong emotion or effect. Quite tellingly, in this poem, the image of Absalom's tomb is superimposed on the image of the Carpathian hollow from Winkler's native Bukovina. And it remains uncertain to which of those two words the herd of goats and the woman in black belong, or if the blow of the horn comes from a Ruthenian Hutzul instrument or from a Middle Eastern shofa. This crossing and blurring of temporal and geographical borders is furthermore emphasized in this poem by transcultural intertextuality. References to Cervantes' Don Quixote and the biblical Absalom, son of David, are just another dialogical gesture interlacing European literary tradition and Hebrew um, classical verse and the narratives of the Torah. So this leads to the next aspect I'd like to touch on today, and that is dialogical gestures in Winkler's self-translations. And on this slide, you see one of those poems written in both German and in Hebrew and also illustrated by Manfred Winkler's for a manuscript. In interviews and letters, Winkler compared his experience of learning Hebrew upon arrival to Israel to a linguistic musical adventure of exceptional intensity. His Hebrew immersion allowed him to revitalize the poetic potency of German the language that had been misused by the National Socialists. At the same time, the unprecedented feeling of being in one's own land, with one's own soil under one's feet, as he described his first contact with Israel, gave him the strength to confront the unspeakable events of the Shoah. Images he wrote, rose up from the past, experiences, impressions returned that I had thought forgotten, their origin only known to me and even this not always. Things that had been buried rose up and were there, the majesty of the past in the present moment. A very intense and creative period for many years set in despite the tremendous difficulties associated with the material and societal, societal integration into a new life. I would compare this time to a musician's piano composition or improvisation with powerful chords. Chords that once faded away, never returned. 
In the process of matching up German and Hebrew versions of a poem, Rick and I noticed that sometimes the two versions are similar or even identical. You can say faithful to each other. And other times they differ substantially, both in form and in content. It became apparent to us that his poetic composition in one language or another did not always evolve linearly. For example, from Hebrew to German or the other way around, but rather by way of simultaneous translation, self-translation, back and forth, back and forth from one language to the other. Translation studies scholar Menachem Perry observes that, observes that simultaneous self-translation in contrast to delayed self-translation executed after completion or even publication of the original text in another language allows for limitless innovative possibilities, since there is no original source text to which the translator must remain faithful. When undertaken by a bilingual writer, the process is especially complex because it requires the transfer not only between languages, but also between literary traditions and socio-historical contexts which invariably leads to bold shifts in translation. So the following two poems exemplify Winkler's techniques of self-translation. And the first poem we tasted unripe fruit, Tamnu Perot Poser, is a good example of a delayed self-translation, meaning German and Hebrew are very similar, almost identical. So therefore, perhaps we'll have Rick read out the Hebrew for us and Courtney read out her English translation of the German. Tamnu perot poser. Tamnu perot poser. Bashanim hayafot biyoter. Biyarot adumim. קראנו להם סתיו. הלכנו בערות אדומים, תחת שמי רקיע נמוכים, שיחקנו עם העננים, קראנו להם סתיו. טעמנו פירות בוסר, לקראת מתק לילות העתידים לבוא. שיחקנו עם שערות משי באור של עופרת. מתחנו אצבעות דקות מעל הנרות, אנו ילדי השואה, בעלי עיני איוב עברות, בעיירות אדומים נערו מעל ראשינו עלים. אל מר בלשון רבים, הנו אלוהים קראנו לו, נפלנו בקריאת שמע אל תוך גלימתו, הקהה מקרקע הגבעות. We tasted unripe fruit. We tasted unripe fruit in the most beautiful years when the redwoods called them all poor. Walked through the redwoods under low skies, played with clouds, called them all poor. Tasted unripe fruit, walked towards the sweetness of the coming nights, played with long hair in the leaden light. Stretched thin fingers over candles, we, the blind children of the Shoah, with Job eyes, and the redwoods shook their leaves onto us. A bitter god of plurality is Elohim. We were crying out to him, falling with our Shema Israel in his dark, earthly cloak of mound. So here the German and the Hebrew version are very similar, almost identical. Now the following poem, only our eyes still bear, nur die Augen tragen noch in the German version, 
slow cemetery Beit Almin ET in the Hebrew version is an example of simultaneous self-translation. And we'll have the English read out first by Courtney and then the Hebrew. Only our, only our eyes still bear. We are walking through a languishing symmetry, passing decrepit dooms by. Great death bringing winds that blow at us, blow an hour here. Crushed columns abruptly rise up as if it were still war and the world a battlefield, dawning, darkening and wintering all at once. An hour here falls yesterday's snow. Dark snow of pallid days falls an hour here. Strain becomes compounding and staying bounding before mirrors of a new uncertain time. Only our eyes still bear lightless, wherever we may walk, their lost God to each other. It is unusually still. Whatever we seek has in common loss been blown away. Someone stays, someone strays. Silent steps eerily echo through the alleys of a fossilized temporality. Beit Almin E.T. Beit Almin E.T. Shabo Hochi Mul Kimronot Cholei Zikna Evan Beshaish Behotot Beshachor Ruchot Shel Mavet Gadon Noshpot Measear Matsevot Omdot Dom Kmo Chayelim Kilu Lotamu Hamilchamot Vaolam Kemin Hago Stay Krav Hanaki Or Bokea Mahashish Mahashich Beet Tuvahona Hat Anu Vene Seva Kaet Behim Zot Yade Hakium Ha Ain Sofi Mibain Ha Aitzi Malbin Horat The House Arenu Yoret Shelek Almoni Shelek Afel Shall Yamim Hivre Mar E no share Al Hasea Benames Ali Hatenu Naset Kveda Yoter, the Amida Tenu Mahutit, the Toch Mar Ot Hasman Habilti Mit Asher Ed Shell Matos Mar Eid Eta Ilamin. Shukolam ha tsaitani nadam po. So here we have many interesting bold shifts, differences between the German and the Hebrew version. And the difference in stanza links is quite obvious. Rick will just point out two differences, two shifts in content. Thank you, Monica. Yes, um, while looking at this poem, we saw two, or well, I could bring to light a couple of differences from um, the wonderful translation that Courtney did from German and what was there in the Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, in the second verse, in the first line, it talks about headstones standing still like soldiers. So there's an element of um, contemporary Israel brought into this poem about the soldier, the presence of soldiers in the land. Um, and it goes on to mention how, as if the wars had not ended, and this is the, the way of the world. Um, later on, um, in the, set, the last verse, it's totally different. To and really brings it home because the verse um, translates more or less to the um, echo of a jet plane shakes the, um, the deaf and the dumb and then the people unable to speak, that their voice um, 
Yeah, so it it brings it just into the present tense of Manfred's life. So in the German language version, it, it invokes the memory of the Shoah. You can see that quite apparently. Whereas in the Hebrew version is more contemporary to the life Manfred experienced in Israel during his time there. Yeah. Thank you. So lastly, I'd like to illustrate some dialogical gestures in Winkler's later writing. And here we have one of his self portraits on the PowerPoint slide and a manuscript of an illustrated poem from the 1970s. The experience of the Middle East and military conflicts culminating in 1967 in the Third Israeli-Arab War compelled Winkler to represent the darkness of war, the memory of the Shoah, and the events of the Jewish-Arab conflict with a sense of grief rather than from a position of judgment. In many of his poems, Winkler attempts to interlace his own biography with the faith of war victims beyond national, ethnic, and religious distinction. The same relational, dialogical approach we noted in his earlier bilingual poems and self-translations in regard to time, space, and language is now apparent in his later poetry in the realm of religion and spirituality. Winkler has been described as a philosopher poet in search of a post-theological humanism and with good reason. As you will see, he pursues the theme of interreligious engagement and theodicy relentlessly and with poignant honesty, asking the question, who are we? Are we the same ones under the chestnut trees of Chernobyl, or during the sinister blackout event of the Shoah, or now in the open space of the desert, in the blue space of the synagogue or the mosque? Or have we changed, transubstantiated, like the grapes that are turned into wine? In the next poem we are going to read, Winkler's poetic association takes its cue from Paul Celan's iconic Shoah metaphors in Poppy and Memory and Only Beyond the Chestnuts is the word transposing these to the experience of religion and spirituality in Jerusalem's Hurva synagogue. This synagogue is another place with a fragmented painful history that reminds the poet of the destruction of the Eastern European Jewish world. Hurva literally means ruin. The synagogue was founded around seven, uh, 1700 on the ruins of a 15th century synagogue. It was destroyed in 1721 by the Ottomans, rebuilt in 1837 when it became Jerusalem's main Ashkenazi synagogue, until it was again destroyed by the Arab Legion in the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, and once more reconstructed in 2010. So, can I ask you, Courtney, to read out the English translation for us, please? Mm -hmm. Kaleidoscope. And they ripen from you into the sinister blackout event. And they flourish like poppies. And they wither chestnut brown. Yes, the yellow grape vines that you picked, the dark red wine that you drank. There, where the desert begins, in the sand waves, they shelter, neither you nor I, but the two who are waiting on a third who does not want to come. The big question of identity blows away the leafy entanglement of their thoughts. Who are we when we say goodbye under the window or in the blue hemisphere of the synagogue before the sudden surge of a prayer? Evening now touches the holy shrine and confuses the conjuncture 
of the whole world. One prays fervently and speaks of Egypt's flesh pot paradise. And finally, the last poem we thought to share today, Mosque, you will see opens with the polyvalent motif of shoes. Suggestive of the sacred space turning into a shared space of grief, mourning, remembrance, and recuperation. In this reading, the mosque has the potential to become a third space of dialogue across multiple contiguous times. The acute time of the present, the grave accent of history, and the circumflex of eternity. Mosque, shoes, old, tattered, next to those elegant and new by the entrance. Inside the barefooted crowd bends over, bending their foreheads to the ground, covered by a carpet, so soft and in the blue. Into the height, heights arches the room, prayer, stillness, and murmurs encircling till the hours come to the end and each foot has found its shoe again. In his poetic work, as we have tried to illustrate today, Winkler translates the hardness of life into tenderness, tenderness into spiritual wonder endlessly documenting his anguish and sorrows, his wrestling with faith and his dreams, while insisting that all manifestations of war against humanity be mercilessly squashed and demanding of his readers to think and remember. Interestingly, in German, those two words Denken and Gedenken share the same root. So how the, does the translator think together with the poet in an attempt to create a dialogue between source text and translation? I will hand over to Courtney, who is at the beginning of her journey, her PhD studies, but has already done some incredibly beautiful work. And she will tell us a little bit about this work of translation of hers. And I think it's best, Courtney, if you don't mind, yes. that we also swap so our um, uh, audience on um, Zoom can also see you. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I'd just like to thank both Bonnie and Rick for welcoming me so warmly to their research team and for always having such a open space of dialogue that I think reflects Manfred Winkler's work so well. And so, I believe the best place to start, I believe the best place to start with this dialogue between the source text and the translation is with the words from Manfred Winkler himself. Like many other poets, he was also a translator. And on June the 5th, 1994, wrote in a letter that, one only gets really close to a poet when one translates him. The details and subtleties that the, the reader overlooks must not escape the translator. They lead to the heart of the poetry. As I read this last part of the quote, it rang out in my ears, to the heart. I've been turning over in my head how to discerningly encapsulate this notion of dialogue within translated poetry. And that led me to think of how William C. Cart, the author of the Poetry Pharmacy, remarked in a presentation named The Power of Poetry that they, the poets, reach out a hand to you and you feel understood. And because you feel understood, it helps you evolve and move on. Poetry has this touching power. It initiates an emotional response as a heart to heart encounter. This initial emotional engagement then flows into an intellectual engagement where we seek to understand how and why we were affected in certain ways. I would like to propose this as a heart-to-heart -heart dialogue and translate 
translated poetry is an extended heart to heart, both in terms of encountering and dialogue. It has to stretch out just that little bit further. For my part of this talk today, I will be briefly elaborating on my approach as a translator, as well as discuss some of the subtle in, intrinsic, su, su, some su, subtleties intrinsic to Manta Vinkler's German poems and how I have carried them across to the heart of the translations. With poetry, the two people sharing the dialogue are naturally the poet and the reader. However, with translated poetry, an intermediary person is needed. A translator who first acts as the, the reader, then as the poet. And so my role as the translator is to find and listen to the heart of the source text and then carry it over to the translation. To achieve this, I have used the humanistic approach that the distinguished translator Michael Gansel expresses as, seeking to recreate the work's humanity, its universality. It is indeed a rather broad description, which I believe lends itself aptly to Manfred Winkler's work once we acknowledge his tireless promotion of universality and humility. Translating with this approach allows us to weave various aspects of the source text into the translation. And to do so accordingly, it is important to come from a place of yearning to learn and understand. And the first part to understand is that of the role of a translator for poets who survived the Shoah. When translating poetry by survivors of the Shoah, there are some specific considerations and responsibilities to be mindful of. In her 2015 book, Translating the Poetry of the Holocaust, Translation, Style, and the Reader, leading scholar Jean Bose Bayer notes that the translator's key responsibility is the accurate memorization of the individual's voice. What this entails is firstly a foundational understanding of the role of language in both the destruction and survival of narratives. Language is not inherently good, as witnessed through the propaganda in, in perpetrating countries such as Nazi Germany and Romania. Language was severely manipulated and to use Yeroa Bauer's terminology, to an absolute evil. Language was weaponized in order to create a silent oblivion. Translation is the adversary to oblivion. It is an afterlife. It's a restorative act that creates a place to keep the memory alive. Due to the delicate nature of this undertaking, it needs to be done with an attuned understanding of the context surrounding the Shoah, and as much as possible, the poet's own experiences with language pre, during, and post Shoah, which all emerge in their dialogue of the poetry with forever distinctive and changing ways. As we have seen already in this presentation, Winkler was a true lover of languages and was very successful in acquiring Hebrew. Remarkably, despite the absolute evil German had been contorted into, Manfred Winkler succeeded in rebuilding his affinity for his maternal language. Rooted in our hearts is the culture that we were born into and grew up in. For Winkler, this is the cosmopolitan culture of Bukovina and its quadrilingual capital city of Chernobyl, a place described by the poet Orza Auslander as an artistic city, a city that hosted many artists poets, lovers of art, literature, and philosophy. This vibrant artistic atmosphere is reflected in Winkler's melodic poetry, and he sings along with the choir of German language Chernobyl's poets, such as Paul Salam, Rosa Auslander, Moses Rosenkranz, and Selma Meerbaum Eisinger, just to name a few. The translation scholar Siobhan Brownlee asserts that, the, that translation is a fundamentally important process in human cultural endeavors. And so, with my translations, I have endeavored to carry across some cultural elements from the cosmopolitan Book of Vina, now only alive in memory. So, let me share a thought with you um, about the translation of color. Our cultures influence the way we both perceive and describe colors. The poets from the Book of Vina region have a distinctive way they see colors, they merge colors, 
There is a sense of blurring the boundaries of colours. This is seen in the first poem, Desert Kaddish. With the, on the, blue on the water's blue grey plain, and far reaching grey yellow land. Originally, I had placed a space between these colours. However, whilst I was reading the English poetry written by Horsa Auslander, I came across instances where she had also had colours all in one word. For example, in the poem, Definition of a Window, she describes the splints as silver pale blue. No spaces, no hyphens, rather a symbiosis of colours. This subtle perception of colour is indeed linked to the heart of the visionary that Man Friedwinkler was and thus must be communicated to the reader of the translation to demonstrate his intrinsic ability to merge. We also hear voices from, we also hear other voices from Chernovitz in Manfred Winkler's poetry. A distinctive voice from this Chernovitz choir that echoes greatly in his poetry is that of Paul Silan, one of the most famous post-Shoah poets. Winkler, a couple of years junior to Silan, was often described as his Nachfolger, successor. Due to their similarities, shared experiences, both coming from the Book of Vina, having a clear mastery of languages, idiosyncratic rhythms, and, an and, an and a continuous inward searching of their own soul. The first stanza of Kaleidoscope demonstrates the intertwining of Vinkla with Salah as there are three clear references, which Monica has already touched upon today, and I would like to reiterate. Firstly, that being the sinister blackout event, which refers to the Shoah, poppies from, the, from Salan's pivotal poetry collection, Poppy and Memory, and chestnut brown from Salan's poem, Beyond the Chestnut Trees, recalling Chernobyl's pre-Shoah, A Lost World. Initially, when I read the poem, I thought, the colour chestnut brown ought to be maroon, something I was used to seeing poppies wilting away to a deep maroon. However, in the context of the Book of Ina, with its abundance of chestnut trees and Salan's poem, the chestnut brown creates a bridge to a safe world of pre Shoah Book of Ina in its poetic expression of the conflicting bittersweetness of the poet's past, a place of great, a place of great joy and trauma. Another instance where Manfred Winkler echoes Paul Sulan is the line, great death bringing winds blow at us, and up in the poem, only our eyes still bear. This is a reference to Sulan's 1958 Prima Prize speech, where he spoke of German passing through the thousand darknesses of death bringing speech at the hands and mouths of Nazis and Nazi sympathizers. However, Paul Sulan's and Manfred Winkler's words do not match up. Silan has this um, Todbringen, which literally translates to death bringing, whereas Winkler has Große Sterben, which is great dying. I chose to incorporate death bringing due to its markedness for the reader of the translation and with the intention that if a reader came across this striking term, they could look it up and thus come across Silan's speech and find connections between the two poets and their thoughts on language in trauma. Another cultural endeavor in this work of translation is Winkler's ardent merging of German and Hebrew. One of the joys of translating Winkler's work is the abundance of new words you encounter. Monica has spoken about how the German and Hebrew words blend together to form an in-between language. However, the Hebrew words are still marked. Now the words striking to the German reader. The poet Desert Kaddish exemplifies this. In the poem, we can hear that Hebrew is a significant part of Winkler's speech as it naturally emerges in his German. This I found rather paradoxical to translate, striking yet natural. And I believe this encapsulates Winkler's poetic spirit rather well. And so in the English translations, I decided to keep all instances of the transliterated Hebrew, just as Winkler had done so in the German. This cultural enrichment is referred to by Homi Baba as a new to come into the world 
Through this hybridity, the reader gets a sense of how cultures can harmonize together. Speaking of harmony, Binkler's poet poetry displays its aptitude and love for sound. As Monica has quoted, Binkler created his poetry as a musical composition, hearing the words as chords and making rhythms, and both German and Hebrew are in concert. A display of what Monica described as an oscillation between two equally active cultures, which produces a new reality, a new poetic experience. The poem, Only Our Eyes Still Bear, has elements of both German and Hebrew that seamlessly work together, such as in stanza three, where there is chiasmus, a stylistic characteristic of Hebrew verse transferred into the German. This is where the phrase becomes inverted in the following line, with an example of this is, in our here falls yesterday's snow, dark snow of pallid days falls in our here. This gesture of cultural intertwining does not go amiss for the German reader, and so it should also be marked in the English translation, as it creates this circling sound, like thoughts turning over and over in your head. Thinkler also cleverly uses repetitive sounds to create a sense of shifting. To carry this over into English, it did call for some interpretation. For instance, once again in Desert Kaddish, we have this blut und verblut. We get the sense of mirroring, yet with something added on, that being this, the prefix fur, which paradoxically in this context actually means to take away something, losing vibrancy. A literal translation of this phrase would be blooming and wilting. And while this is still beautifully poetic and image producing, it doesn't have the same sense of shifting in terms of sound. I've attempted to mirror this with bursting and dispersing. And although they don't have the same root as in the German, they have these plosive sounds, this b and p. You sort of get a sense of when you're saying it, you can feel the yeah, it's, it creates a sense of the tangible yet intangible. And I believe focusing on the sound helps to create a sense of being blown away at this wondrous image of the sunrise in the desert. And at the same time, retains a fairly similar sonic image Binkley created in the source text. The sense of shifting can also be felt in a whole poem. One that particularly stands out to me is only our eyes still bear. At the start of this poem, we have these distressing combinations of words, languishing symmetry, decrepit domes, great death ringing, which take us aback and cause us to take time to grasp the situation. As we reach the final stanza, it feels as if we've been in a trance. Cascading cadences, mixed with somewhat discordant ends, reflect the sense of spiraling and stumbling with anguish. Then, this unusual stillness encroaches, yet with Winkler's mastery of sound and paradox, we can hear and feel someone's footsteps. It is as if we can hear Manfred Winkler's heart beating and echoing in his mind. As this reflects his state of mind and sound is intrinsic to his process, a word for word translation here would not suffice, rather an interpretation of the senses. Hence the change from Yiman Shtib, Yiman Ged, which translates as someone stands, someone goes. So the more evocative, someone stays, someone strays. And also with Geistern, which means to haunt, and I have translated as eerily echo. And this poem echoed long in my mind and heart. Each poem in this talk has in some way had Winkler reach out his hand to me as a reader, none more so than this poem. It has an undeniable universal spirit and experience, skillfully created by Winkler's individual implementation of the conceptual metaphor of how, of how the eyes are the windows to the soul. In this poem, we see both what the eyes bear to the world and what's going on behind them. Dealing with traumatic experiences and an inner turmoil of memory. This sentiment made me reflect and have a dialogue with my own personal experience. I too have seen how the eyes change and fade when something traumatic happens, 
such as a deer. And although there is still a spark in them, the eyes are never the same. They could never be the same. This is a bittersweetness of humanity, universality, of how we all bear, our, we all bear sorrow in our from our lives in our eyes. And finally, I'd like to briefly speak on the considerate and ambiguous, ambiguous nature of the source text and translation. This is an important part to his poetry. And I would myself say the foundations of translating him are paradox, faith, and ambiguity. Ambiguity can spark both confusion and dialogue. And thus it creates engagement and leads to a space of interpretation and self-reflecting. These instances are usually to do with Winkler himself musing on faith, humanity, and universality. Our last poem of today, Moss, embodies this fully. Firstly, with these shoes, only described by the attributes, not to who they belong to. And they mention that in the end, each shoe belongs to a foot. The universality and the intrinsic ambiguity of this poem have such power that the first time I read it, I could instantly contextualize it in a couple of cultures from my own experiences. I first thought of um, in Istanbul with the Hagia Sophia, which I don't know if many of you have been there, but there's a constant changeover of religions from Christianity to Islam. And when you go there, you see the crucifix and you see Arab script. It's a real place of, um, a beautiful place, but a place of a lot of pain and yeah. And then I thought here in New Zealand, when we go to a marae, when we take off our shoes and we have to come, we go to the sacred place and come back and put our shoes on. When reading this poem, maybe all, we all may be able to think of our own personal experiences. And yet we carry these universal experiences within our hearts. Another ambiguous part of this poem is this emblauen. Finkler created this word, and so there's no dictionary entry to work from, only the context. And we know it's a noun because it's capitalized. In, in German, every noun is capitalized. However, in English, this isn't the case. I could have put it in lowercase, though I don't think it renders the same poetic potency as the source text. As in English, we have these many set phrases such as out of the blue, into the blue, which I think have more of negative connotations. In the source text, there is a sense of something greater, something transcendental. And so I decided to keep the capitalization to signify this. Could this be a feeling of serenity, the blue of the heavens, of peace, of freedom, depths? The kind of blue is up to the reader to interpret and reflect on. Who are we when we experience the atmosphere of a sacred space? Where do we wish to go? Manfred Winkler, engages us to have this dialogue with ourselves and search within our hearts. And that is the power of his poetry. It sparks us to engage in introspective dialogue. The fact that we all understood the poems differently and in saying that feel understood differently, I believe reflects the humanity and universality of his words. Today, I've discussed what led me to recreate the heart of his poetry in my translation, through seeking out a few details and subtleties, carefully listening to them, and then carrying them across in a humanistic approach to translation. I do hope these words from the poet have reached out to you and you feel understood. And by being so, you too can have a heart-to-heart -heart dialogue with yourself. Thank you very much.